Hey. Oh, sorry. Jude, 20 to 21. Those of you that are of a certain age, you laughed. Those of you that are like of a certain age too, you're like, why? What? What's that? <clears throat> Jude 20 to 21. This is what it says. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Jude 20, 21. Amen. Our title, On Guard and On to Growth. On Guard and On to Growth. As far as our salvation is concerned, and we've been talking about this the past Weeks since Easter, all has been accomplished, meaning it's done. All that's needed to make it work has been done. That's why Jesus on the cross, we said, it is finished. What's finished? It's mission. He was actually saying mission accomplished. It was completed. Therefore, in terms of sports illustrations, the ball is in our court. Does that make sense? If Those of you that are into sports like me. <laughs> I, I watch a lot of sports. <laughs> the ball is in our court. Everything that God needed to do, done, accomplished, prepared. Ball is in your court. How about in terms of cooking or baking? Some of you are into that. Some of you are into the eating. All the recipe ingredients are in. It's all there. It's all available. All you need to do is to work it. It's still on you. In terms of any project, any mission, it's all systems go. The writer of this book, Jude, let me give you a little background, was the brother of Jesus. Some are saying, it's, uh, it's, his name is also Thaddeus. They named him Thaddeus, which was a nickname for Jude. Oh, that's also to kind of separate him from Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. Now, to, so that they're not confused for one another because it's a common name at that time, they called him Jude, this, Judas Iscariot, and then this one they called Jude Thaddeus, or Thaddeus. All right. <clears throat> what he did was he was warning believers of some false teachers, false doctrine that was coming into the church. The church was in its formation years. They were trying to verify everything with the scriptures that they knew and that they had with the teachings and the proclamations of Jesus. The establishment of that church. It was very important they get it right. He was telling them, you need to, you need to contend for the faith. That's actually the, the, a major theme in the book of Jude. Contend for the faith. Look at verse 3. Look at your Bible. Look at verse 3. It says, you need to contend for the faith. You need to fight for what you believe in. And then he's saying, not just to fight for it, to be able to do that successfully, to defend the faith, to fight for it, first things first, you need to build yourselves up in your most holy faith. So that's in verse 20. So verse 3 is the part that says, be on guard. Verse 20 is the one that says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Those two Key themes give you the whole idea of the book of Jude. He was writing to tell them, be on guard and on to growth, spiritual growth. What does it mean to build yourselves up in your most holy faith? He was telling them, 
Now, false teachings and false winds of doctrine are going to come. You need to be edified, built up. You need to be fortified, strengthened. And you need to be reinforced so that you're not wishy-washy, you're not blown by every false teaching. You're not drawn by all kinds of different doctrine. You need to be solid, secure, edified, fortified, reinforced in your faith. The picture that he's building for them, you need to be like a strong tower. At that time, towers were important parts of their architecture. Or a wall. You know, cities were fortified with walls. He's saying, don't just have thin walls. Fortified, strong walls. Not only that, if you were building a house, make sure that your house is built on good, solid foundation. Remember Jesus' teaching in the Gospels? He said, if you are a wise man, you will build your house on the rock, on what's solid. And once it's built, Paul was saying, you edify it, you strengthen it, you fortify it. You get the picture. You get the what he's trying to say. Be on your guard. The attacks are going to come. Make sure that your structure, your faith, your uh, spiritual being is strengthened, fortified against the attacks that will come and make sure that it's growing up. An edifice, an edification or the fortification of that is the building up of that faith. In other words, he was saying, do your part. Do your part in making sure that you're growing in this, our faith. He's also saying, grow up. Be mature in your life as a believer. Don't always be the victims of your circumstances. You know how some people are always the victim. They are who they are because of someone else. It's always someone else's fault. could be true for some instances, but there are those that are, have a victim mentality. Uh, Jude was telling these disciples and these apostles, or these, these followers of Jesus, don't be victims of the bad environment. Take responsibility for your own growth. All right. There's an infant, if you latch a baby, one of the cutest things on the internet are always babies. Some of you will argue and say it's cats. No, it's babies. <clears throat> When the infant, maybe like a few months old, or it's trying to talk, it's trying to walk, it is so cute. It doesn't make sense what they're saying. They're drooling all over. They're bumbling and tumbling around, trying to stand up, trying to crawl. It's so cute, right? It's therapeutic. Some of you that need some time to enjoy, do that. Watch. Watch. Uh, Baby struggle, walking or talking, it's so cute. But, you know, you project that maybe 10 years down the line, 12 years down the line. They're teenagers already. If they're still crawling, if they still cannot talk, if they're still drooling while talking and throwing up every few seconds, there's something wrong. There's an awkwardness, that identity crisis they're going through. If they're bumbling through it, stumbling through it, and, and of course, some of us will say, well, it's understandable. Growing pains. But later on, when that guy is 30 or 40 years old, when that woman has their own family, and still they're making the same mistakes in terms of walk and talk, there's really something seriously wrong. Even in terms of nature, we expect people to grow up. We expect people to mature. Who you were four years ago, seven years ago, cannot be the same person as you are now. Uh-oh. What, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm, I'm still who I am. You know what I'm saying. If there's no change, in terms of your spiritual status, in terms of your relationship with God, if it's static, number one, you won't be here anymore. You probably have faded away. You probably have been blown away by the wind. But if you're here, 
and you're growing, then that's a good expectation. We expect people yearly, weekly, monthly to be changing, growing into Christ-likeness. See, see the, the, the whole presumption, the whole assumption of a theme like pursuing Christ-likeness is the change that you go through that we call spiritual growth. So it's not enough that you're on guard against the attacks on your faith, but now you need to be growing, fortifying, reinforcing that faith. If you're not growing up, there's something seriously wrong. You need to examine yourselves. It's not hopeless. It's just that you need to make a few changes, a few decisions. We should take personal responsibility for our growth and maturity. Amen? Have you heard someone say, I'm not growing because of him. I'm not growing because of her. I'm not growing because of that church, that organization. That If you've heard that, uh, it's a cop out. People need to take personal responsibility for their growth and their maturity. Amen? Mm. That's why we need to be able to say, I am responsible for my growth, my maturity. Let's say that with me. I am responsible for my growth. I am responsible for my maturity. Amen. And you are. How do we do that, Pastor? What does Jude say in terms of how we're going to do this? Number one, he says, you need to strengthen your inner man. Look at verse 20. It says in the second part, build up yourselves in your most holy faith. How? By praying in the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? How do you pray in the Holy Spirit? It's talking about strengthening your inner man with some spiritual disciplines. You need to train your spiritual man, your inner being. How do you do that? Simple. There's prayer. It says so there. There's the Word of God. There's fellowship with other believers. There's the constant sharing of that faith. Just those four pillars. Concentrate on those. Those are the basics. Prayer, connection with God. Word, the study, the constant feeding of God's Word. Fellowship, getting together with fellow believers for encouragement and for service. Then the fourth, sharing of that faith. It has to be going out somewhere. You have to be able to share that with people that you care for, for even people that you meet, acquaintances. <clears throat> we have to admit not much attention has been given to our inner man. Too much attention maybe has been given to our outer man, to how we look, how we are projected, how we impress others. You know, in sociology, we call that impression management. Too much of our time has been how do they perceive me instead of how am I really? How am I really inside? More of you are talking about like, yes, I go to church and you have selfies to prove it. That's good. That's, that's all. That's the culture. But if that's all there is to you, it's like there's a Bible reading here, selfie. There's fellowship with the church, selfie. There's an event at church, selfie. Oh, here's the pastor. Selfie. Because if that's all there is to that, it's about managing that impression that you are growing spiritually, then you're not really growing spiritually. Too much focus on the outside. Would you agree? Just in terms of feeding, how many times of a day in a day do you eat? Change topic, Pastor. Let's just talk about what Sister Andrea was talking. Let's just talk about tithing, maybe. <laughs> that's the next thing I don't want to talk about. The way I eat. Oh my goodness. Now, I'm not saying that, that you're wrong. and Maybe you are. But I'm saying, if only we fed our spirit as much as we were feeding our bodies. In short, if we were taking care of our spiritual bodies in the same way that we pay attention to our physical bodies, we would be so much healthier today. Amen? 
of course, it's one being, but you need to concentrate on a few things in terms of taking care of your spiritual man. You are not helpless with these things. These things are not beyond you. Amen? They're right there. You can easily do that. If you really wanted to, if you made that decision, if you made that resolution at the beginning of the year, I want to grow spiritually this year. What have you done since? It's already almost the end of May. What have you done to grow in your faith? In terms of prayer. In terms of the word. In terms of church or fellowship. In terms of witnessing and sharing. You can't do it on your own. and with your own, you, Just your abilities. That's why Paul was quick to say in Ephesians 5.18, Be filled. Be controlled. Be empowered and enveloped by the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. On your own, the spiritual growth thing, you can't do it. I mean, it's so hard to pray. You'll need the Holy Spirit's help to pray. In reading the Word, you'll need the Holy Spirit's help to discipline you, to study, and the Holy Spirit's help to help you absorb it and learn it and understand it, gain insight from it, and the Holy Spirit's help to apply it in real life. Right? That's why Paul was right. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by any other spirits there. I'm talking about those of you that are into spirits. But be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He wants you to grow. And if you want to, He will help you. It's the two of you in partnership together. Strengthen your inner man. There's an author of a book. He was driving through Tampa, Florida. Nice place. There were orange trees everywhere. I didn't know there was a lot of oranges. In... Now I know. There's a lot of oranges in Florida. He stopped for breakfast and ordered orange juice for his breakfast. Oh, the, the server was saying, Oh, uh, sorry, sir. We don't have any orange juice. I can't bring you orange juice today, our machine, it broke. (laughs) At first, he was dumbfounded. Literally, they were surrounded by millions and millions of oranges, and surely they had oranges maybe in the kitchen. Maybe they had some kind of a juicer or... But what was the problem of that restaurant? The problem was they had become dependent on a machine on a gadget, on technology, to get it for them. So even if the resources were there, they were not able to harness that resource because they were dependent on a machine. And that reminds us how Christians are sometimes like that already. I'm not growing because the internet is slow. Not growing because your live stream is glitchy. I'm not growing because, you know, I don't have a Bible. <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying. They may be surrounded by Bibles in their homes, in their computers, in their tablets, in their smartphones, all kinds of technology available, but if say something happens to your internet, something happens to a Sunday service, like maybe a lockdown, God forbid, They have no nourishment. They don't know how to get nourishment for their souls. This is within our ability, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. Amen? The problem is not a lack of resources or the spiritual food. It's available. It is finished. It is accomplished. But that many Christians haven't grown enough to know how to get it themselves. You know what they're depending on? They're depending on some cute pastor preaching to them for 20, 30 minutes. Now, reverse that. If you fed your body the way you're feeding your spirit, ouch. <clears throat> what are these spiritual disciplines I'm talking about? The Word, the Bible. Prayer, worship, meditation, solitude. You know that solitude is a very powerful way that God can just block out things and start 
focusing on you and what really matters. That's why Jesus is also often seen retreating in solitude. It's a spiritual discipline. Prayer, meditation, the word in solitude. I know, I, like, some of you, like me, maybe, you're energized with fellowship with others. And that's true. That's, that's, that really happens. I'm energized when there's people. When I'm alone, when I'm isolated, I, energy is drained out of me. I, I get depressed. Uh, I need to see a therapist. But, you know, <laughs> but I'm talking about uh, it's important that you know how to get together with people and get, uh, and get growth from that. But it's also important to retreat and be able to pray to God alone. Read the word, meditate on it. Silence is the time for growth. Fellowship, community, service, belonging, witnessing and sharing, all these disciplines are all within our ability. Why it's not happening, I don't know. But we need to strengthen our inner man. Number two, you need to stay within God's boundaries. Do you see that? Verse 21. Jude was saying, go ahead, you pray in the Holy Spirit. Then you also need to keep within God's love. There's boundaries, there's limits. Verse 21a. It simply means that God has given us a lot of freedom with guidelines and limits on how to enjoy it. If we stay within limits, we will experience His blessings. If we stay within the boundaries that God has set up, it will be for our best life, our growth, and our maturity. <laughs> right? One of, the, one of the things that they will do to preschoolers, one of the exercises they will always do is simply to give them a coloring book. Then they give them crayons. And what did, what's the instruction of the teacher? Go ahead and color it what you like, but color inside the lines. And you'll be surprised. You see some of the works of one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old. It's like, oh, yeah. They're, they're like, oh, this is the line. And it, it just goes. They, they're still lacking that, some of that control, some of that self-control in their motor skills, it goes beyond the lines. It violates the line, in, per se. Now, he project that into our Christian life. Some of us love coloring beyond the lines. Oh, that's, that's, that's a freedom that God gave you, but you want to use that freedom outside the boundaries and the limits that God has set. That's why you're not growing. Hmm. In Genesis, one of our brother's favorite verses, God did say, you may eat of any fruit of any tree except that one. There was that limit. There's that boundary. Where did Adam and Eve go? Right beside that boundary. And of course, they crossed it. Adam and Eve. To this day, we feel it. God's love is always for our good if and only if we obey and stay within the limits He has set. Pastor, I, I kind of get what you said. What exactly are you talking about? I'm talking about like what Sister Andrea was sharing. Staying within God's limits for our, say, finances. Oh. How about staying within God's limits for, say, sexual relations? How about staying within the limits and using our freedom within gender relations, within marriage, within family, within church functioning, what to do, what to prioritize, within time management, within courtship, with dating, holy living, business and pleasure. In every area of our life, God has given us the freedom. Enjoy it. Have peace and prosperity in that but only stay within the limits and you will experience the joy that comes with being blessed. But what do we do? We want to test it. We want to use the same freedom we were given to go beyond those boundaries, beyond the limits, and we suffer because of that. Look at John 15, verses 9 and 10. 
Jesus was saying, I'm the branch, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you stay within my love, verses 9 and 10, I'll read it to you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain, abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Stay within the mission. You're free. Don't buy into the world's idea of freedom. That to be free means to do whatever I want to do. That's why you have bodies. People do what they want to do. They don't stay within the limits, the guidelines, the boundaries. <clears throat> Some of us are not growing because we have compromises in these areas. Some of us have a hard time with staying within the boundaries. You know why? Because we have, we're very weak spiritually. We have not strengthened our inner man. So number one goes with number two. In fact, Jude was saying, you go, stay number two. How do you stay with number two? Number one, strengthen your inner man. Because it takes spiritual muscles to carry this load. Amen? Number three, sit patiently for the Lord's move. Verse 21b, how are we going to be building ourselves up? You need to wait for the mercy of the Lord. Practice patience. Endure the test of time. Ask yourself, will I last? Will I make it through trials? Will I make it through some shaking, some problems, some trouble? Because that's, that's how growth will happen. Don't, don't be the first to complain about stuff that are happening in your life. Before you complain, first check yourself. Maybe this is time, a time for me to grow my roots, to strengthen my spiritual muscles, to exercise my faith. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking some provisions, some finances. There's some deadlines. Go ahead and pray. Exercise faith at that time. I'm sick. My, my mother is sick. My brother is feeling unwell. Let me pray for them and exercise faith in that area. How will you know what you have available for you if there's no trial or testing for it? In that, you need to persevere. In that, you need to be patient. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher, says, because of perseverance, the snail reached the ark. <laughs> Isaiah 40, verse 31, I have there. It says simply, they you shall renew their strength. Those that hope upon the Lord, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you want strength to be renewed, refreshed, recharged, you need to know how to sit patiently for the Lord and for the Lord's move. See, patience builds character. God does His best work when you are desperately hanging on to Him and hanging on to His next move. Moses went up the mountain to get Ten Commandments. Remember this in Exodus? He went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, the initial one. Did you know that there were two sets? Because the first one, he went up, God gave him the tablet, was explaining that to him. He comes back to the Israelites down the mountain, Mount Sinai. What were they doing? They were worshipping the golden calf. And they were partying, partying like there's no tomorrow. The gold that they plundered from Egypt, they decided, why don't you, we melt it. And let's shape a golden calf because we don't know if Moses is ever coming back. It's been, you know, like a week or two. And maybe he's not coming back. Let's just worship this golden calf. And they partied and reveled there like the pagans did at that time. How impatient we get. Some of us don't grow because growth requires patience. Mm. Have you planted seeds? Like if you planted your bulbs for the spring next time, you plant them around October. 
you plant them in October, if by second week of October, you say, I wonder if it's growing. And then you dig it up and see, oh, it's, no, it's not, still not growing. Let's plant it back. Sometime about just before Thanksgiving. You say, oh, maybe it's the middle of November. Let's try and dig it up again. Let's see the bulbs. Oh, it's still not happening. Then you do it again December and then January. By February, you have rotten bulbs. Wet, soggy, I know. <laughs> Wet, soggy, rotten, smelly bulbs. They're not going to grow. They're not, because you, you were not patient enough to wait for a process of growth and development. Sometimes God is making you grow. I will dare say God is forcing you to grow in a situation, but you're so impatient. We're like that with our kids. We're like that with, our, with ourselves and with others. Our prayer, Lord, my husband, change him, mold him. It's been 20, 20 days already that we're married. He's still the same. Come on. But even if it's 20 years or 30, patience, not just with others, but with ourselves. Are you patient with it? Some of us are, are not growing because of frustration, because we don't see the growth that we want to see in ourselves. We're not waiting because we don't have the strength to wait. We have not strengthened our spiritual man, and usually that brings us to some Violations of God's boundaries. Character formation. Training in, com uh, in uh, training competence and building confidence. Uy, puro si pala yan. Character formation, competence training, confidence building takes a lot of patience. It requires sometimes just sitting patiently for the Lord's move. Amen? That's how we will grow. So in summary, let me show you a verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. Paul was saying, you, the saints, what God is doing, he's wanting to equip you for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, not just you, but as a unit of a whole church, a whole community, being built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining, there's a measure, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Strengthen your inner man. Stay within God's limits and God's boundaries. Sit patiently for the Lord's move. Amen? Let's stand up, let's pray. Amen. Amen. Spiritual growth is a must for all believers. It begins with taking responsibility, making that decision, and we'll, we'll make that today in prayer. Make that decision. I am responsible for my own growth. And utilizing all the tools, His Word, the Church, the Holy Spirit, and some divine opportunities, including trials, to use that for the nurturing of faith and exercising spiritual gifts that are available for service and then reaching out, always on guard and on to growth. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.